Dear Koti, my sister, welcome to another womanhood video. Trying to do something a little different and mainly because today we're going to be talking a lot about submission and a lot about the feminine nature and so I thought why not try to get a pretty good background that you know kind of shows submission you know what I mean so um, this is gonna be the backdrop for today and let's go ahead and dive in but of course before we start you always know I have my notes so if I'm ever looking down it's not because I'm being rude or afraid to look at the camera it's just more of I want to make sure I stay on track also we do have a Facebook group for the Dear Koti YouTube channel which I highly 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 suggest that you go ahead and join the link is in the description box below and one of the main reasons that I really created this group was so that we could have a safe space for us to be able to share anything that we learn. Um, just yesterday I posted a playlist that is not public on YouTube. So it is a video playlist of end time prophecy of a documentary and it's a really really awesome documentary that I wanted to share with you guys in the Facebook group so that we could really discuss it and um, talk about it. And then I also recently just shared a PDF, a downloadable PDF that I had found while perusing um, in my research online and it's a PDF that really showcases how Paul was definitely pro-Torah um, and so people like to try to twist his verses to be anti-Torah or anti-law but that was not the case. So, you know, different things like that are just, you know, when I'm having a rough day, like I'll post in there and be honest and be like, look, I'm having a rough day. And then like you guys will encourage me and, you know, vice versa and, you know, giving each other advice and just really supporting each other like a tribe of women should. And it's really awesome because we are all like minded women who are all on that same spiritual path of really unveiling the truth of Yah and just listening to his Holy Spirit and coming out of Babylon. So, um, if you are somebody who finds yourself alone on this journey, you are really not alone. Yah has really, you know, pushed me to create this group and create this tribe and sisterhood because I was feeling that way myself. Um, so I definitely suggest you join. Again, link is in the description box below. Um, also, for anybody who is new to this channel, hello, my name is Sinead. Nice to meet you. Definitely hit that subscribe button down below. This channel is for women only and it is for spiritual women who want to learn and then be able to teach their family the word and truth of Yah and because that's part of our role as women and also being a feminine woman and also just being a woman who is prepared for what's to come. So that is the main focus of this channel. So you'll see videos around the faith foundation so that we can really come out of Babylon and learn the truth of Yahuwah and his word and his son, the Messiah, our elder brother, our high priest, our king. Um, also going to be videos on being a feminine woman, what the role of a woman is, you know, really playing out that role as best as we can. Um, and walking in Torah is a huge thing we're going to be covering on this channel. And also just being a spiritual woman in general, which literally means following the Torah. So learning the difference between your spirit, your soul, your mind, your body, all that stuff and how to walk spiritually and also preparedness. So any tips that I can share on how I'm preparing for any kind of emergencies. So that's really the focus of this channel and what kind of videos you can expect to see. If those interest you, definitely hit the subscribe button. Um, so like I was saying, for anybody who's new, just so you know who I'm referring to, if you're new to the truth or new to the walk, um, I do call our God, our Father, our Creator, Yahuwah, which is his Hebrew name, which is his name that he's given us in his word. Um, so I also will call him for short, Yah. So Yah or Yahuwah is always referring to our Father, our Creator, our God, our Elohim, um, just so that you know who I'm referring to. And then also the Messiah. Most of the time I will call him Yahusha or just the Messiah. Um, but that is how I pronounce his Hebrew name, Yahusha. So if you do pronounce it differently, just so that you do know who I'm referring to. So let's go ahead and hop in. Today we're going to be talking about feminine nature. So um, the last couple of videos in this series, we talked about the fem feminine mannerisms, so your behavior, and then we also talked about the feminine appearance, so your literal outward appearance. And so today we're really going to talk about the feminine nature, which is more of your temperament or your character. Well, we'll just say your temperament. So diving in, Although most women easily embrace outer femininity, which is stuff that we've covered in the last two videos, changing one's personality to become more loving and feminine takes some effort. In this part of femininity, we aren't simply using our hands in a feminine way or wearing a house dress instead of jeans and a t-shirt to complete our homemaking. Rather, we're striving to change our spirits, our inner selves. 
The feminine temperament can be described as the framework that supports all the other aspects of femininity. So it's super, super, super important. Without inner femininity, the rest of the feminine persona really becomes a fake. It becomes a phony, a facade, something that's literally only skin deep and people can tell that you're not truly feminine and that you're just faking it to try to make it, but you're not quite making it. So a woman with such temperament can be likened to a magnolia tree. And this example that was that I came across was really, really awesome. So if you've ever seen a magnolia tree, if you haven't, I suggest you Google it. Um, or I'll try to insert an image at some point in this video. But it looks very fragile and spindly and is covered with large, velvety, sweet-smelling white or pink um, flowers. And it reminds me because I know my mom loves, like, when she goes to Bath and Body Works, this is what the magnolia tree reminds me of. It reminds me of the um, sweet cherry blossom scent that my mom is obsessed with. And I have to admit, it does smell pretty good. And it's a very feminine smell if you've never smelled it. Um, but that's the like immediate smell that I get when I hear about the velvety, sweet-smelling white or pink flowers. So, however, the wood of the magnolia tree is one of the hardest woods on earth and parts of the tree have been used to heal various diseases for thousands of years. So the magnolia tree symbolizes a woman who's truly sweet, feminine, loving, and charming, and who is also inwardly strong and spirited. So it's a balance, and we're going to talk more about that as we go on. So a woman whose nature or temperament is feminine gives over leadership to her husband and enjoys being the help me or the partner or the teammate. She graces, graciously obeys her husband as long as he does not ask her to violate her moral principles. She respects her husband and does not go around gossiping about his, his mistakes or his, you know, his failings um, or and we don't fail to serve his preferences. For example, if a man wants some kind of weird combination of food, you would make it for him without giving him some flack about it or without going and telling everybody, my husband's weird as heck. <laughs> so while courting, so while you're single, a woman can display a spirit of submission by happily following her suitor's plans for their dates. Again, as long as those plans are not immoral or illegal. And so this really represents a great way to test the person that you're dating, to test their trustworthiness, and to see if his leadership is something that you could really truly support for the rest of your life. The feminine woman with a natural feminine temperament should be an expert in running her home, you know, except in those cases, of course, where you have a disability or you're sick or whatever the case is. She cannot, however, do everything in life to an expert level. So she devotes herself to her stewardship in the home and the family. She's not emotionally needy. She has a clear sense of self and a health and healthy boundaries. But she doesn't she but she does need a protective, providing, guiding husband to fulfill competently the four feminine roles at the exemplary level. So one thing that we learned in Womanhood 101, which I'll leave the link below to that section on the blog um, on the website for the Womanhood post. But one thing that we learned is that women and men have distinct roles. And so we can't be great at everything. And we have to realize that as women. I know we want to be great at everything and we want to be able to do the man's job and the woman's job. But if we would focus more on the role that pertains to us as women, we would be able to be just super excellent in that role and be able to, you know, run that role perfectly, you know, rather than trying to do everything and fail at everything because you're spreading yourself too thin. So a woman with a feminine temperament allows herself to feel, these are all things that we're going to go a little bit deeper into, so don't worry. Uh, when she enters the workforce, she must sacrifice this part of herself to survive. Often she must numb out at least to a degree in order to make it through the rigors of the workplace. And I have definitely experienced this myself. You definitely become a little bit more hardened when you enter the workplace as a woman. Um, because, you know, when someone speaks in an overly harsh way, you may tear up a little. And this is something that, you know, again, personal experience, I definitely experienced while working, whether it was in retail or in a call center. I had definitely had moments where um, I noticed myself tearing up or I've noticed myself getting upset. But in the workplace, you know, you have to really learn how to not show your feelings. You know, you have to almost really just become like a man. That's why 
Um, the men typically, you know, in older cultures were the men who were the ones who were the providers, um, except in cases where someone was a widow or, you know, her, her husband was not around. Um, but the man was typically the provider because they were built differently, the women, built to be able to handle certain situations while women were built to handle other situations that men just cannot fathom, like a crying child. A woman can easily deal with a crying child, you know, and know what to do. But a man typically is like, you know, they can't take it and they're ready to walk out of the room. So that's just one example. Um, but anyway, so when she hears a child of a child being mistreated, her heart is touched. This emotional awareness allows a woman to express and experience the fear she feels rather than suppressing the fear and pretending like it doesn't exist. She feel, fears real dangers as well as dangers that exist mostly in her own mind. So right now, I just want to say we're just describing briefly the feminine nature. And then, like I said, we're going to go a little bit deeper into it. So in the feminine nature, there's a kind of weakness, softness, and delicateness. The feminine woman is inclined to be trustful, accept, adaptable, fearful, with tender emotions for the innocent and the suffering. In addition, she has a spirit of sweet submission and a dependency upon men for their care and protection. There is no male aggressiveness, competence, or fearlessness, or a male air of command. There's no masculine strength or ability. And again, this has nothing to do with not being strong or having ability or being competent. It's about distinguishing between the masculine and the feminine. So this feminine nature sharply defines the difference between men and women, enhancing their attraction for each other. We should be grateful for this difference and try in every way to preserve it as best as we can. For generations, various cultures of people have recognized and appreciated this difference. And this is something that as we have really westernized ourselves in the US especially, we've really gotten away from and we've gotten caught up in this whole feminism movement and equality where you know, we were made equal, but for some reason, us women feel like we have to do things like a man and be, be a man in order to be equal, but that is not the case. So various cultures in the past and even cultures today still honor the differences between a man and a woman, but somehow we've gotten far astray. So we really need to get back to that path. The feminine nature awakens a man's chivalry for a woman, his impulse to protect her and provide for her. Don't think that chivalry is an imposition on a man. One of the most pleasant sensations a real man can experience is his consciousness of the power to give his manly power and protection. When you rob him of this sensation of superior strength and ability, you rob him of his manliness. A man delights in protecting and sheltering a feminine dependent woman. The bigger, manlier, and more sensible a man is, the more he seems to be attracted to this quality. So what happens when an average man comes in contact with an obviously able, intellectual, and competent woman, manifestly independent of any help a mere man can give, this is typically what happens. When he meets a woman who is basically an, I'm an independent woman, I can do everything on my own, I'm a feminist. You know, he simply doesn't feel like a man. In the presence of such strength and ability in a mere woman, he feels like a futile, ineffectual imitation of a man. It is one of the most uncomfortable and humiliating sen sensations a man can experience, so that the woman who arouses it becomes repugnant to him. So really, he just does not become attracted to her. A man cannot get any joy or satisfaction from protecting and providing for a woman who can obviously do perfectly well without him. He only delights in protecting and sheltering a woman who needs his manly care or at least appears to need it. So this doesn't mean that you're some damsel in distress all the time and that you can't do anything yourself, but there's a difference between allowing and letting the man to take his role and to do it himself and to take care of you versus you feeling the need to be in control. When you feel the need to be in control and you feel the need to take his position, he then sacrifices that position and then becomes actually more feminine and begins to rely more on you as the woman and then that leads to tons of stress because you're trying to fulfill both roles when we were not created to do so. So when a man is in the presence of a tender, gentle, trustful, dependent woman, he immediately feels a sublime expansion of his power to protect and shelter this frail and delicate creature. In the presence of such weakness, he feels stronger, more competent, and bigger and manlier than ever. 
This feeling of strength and power is one of the most enjoyable things that he can experience. The apparent need of a woman for care and protection, instead of arousing contempt for her lack of ability, actually appeals to the very noblest feelings within him. So instead of a man looking on a woman and feeling like, man, she can't do jack, it's more of, man, she needs my help. Let me rise to the occasion and help her. So you gotta also remember that men tend to think differently than women. Now, of course, there's always the cases of the men who love a woman who's very independent and very feministic. You know, there's definitely pockets of those men around. But for the most part, when given the chance, a man will definitely rise up to the occasion and become very manly and will protect and provide and guide you if you allow him to. You have to give him the room to be able to do that. So, a great example of the feminine nature is found in Amelia in Thackeray's Vanity Fair. So, the, a quote from reading um, Thackeray's Vanity Fair says, those who formed the small circle of Amelia's acquaintances were quite angry with the enthusiasm with which the other sex regarded her. For almost all men who came near her loved her, though no doubt they would be at a loss to tell you why. She was not brilliant, not witty, nor wise over much, nor extraordinarily handsome. But wherever she went, she touched and charmed uh, every one of the male sex, as invariably as she awakened the scorn and incredul incredulity of her sisterhood. I think it was her weakness, which was her principal charm, a kind of sweet submission and softness, which seemed to appeal to each man she met for his sympathy and protection. So there you had an example of a woman who truly embodied a feminine nature, and so men were completely attracted to her, couldn't even tell you why. And all of the women in her circle were completely jealous and angry because they weren't getting the attention that she was getting. But there was something about her that was different. Another example would be Mrs. Woodrow Wilson, or Ellen, um, who was the wife to President Woodrow Wilson. So writing to his wife, Ellen, President Wilson, Wilson said, what a source of studying and of strength it is to me in such seasons of too intimate self-questioning to have one fixed point of confidence and certainty that even unbroken, excellent perfection of my little wife with her poise, her easy capacity in action, her unfailing courage, her quick, efficient thought, and the charm that goes with it all, the sweetness, the feminine grace, none of the usual penalties of efficiency, no hardness, no incisive sharpness, no air of command, or of unyielding opinion. Most women who are efficient are such terrors. So here he's really comparing his wife to more of a masculine woman. He's saying how feminine his woman is and how much really of a relief it is to be around her because she's not going to criticize him like a man would or like a manlier woman would. Um, so really just showcasing the characteristics of his wife being a feminine woman of feminine nature. So occasionally we notice a capable, efficient, masculine type of woman who's very much admired by men. And we're going to explain why. She may be exceedingly skilled in management or have ingenious ideas about how to make the business world work. Um, but don't let a man's admiration, which is different than love, um, so don't let a man's admiration or such for such a woman confuse you. His admiration for her doesn't mean he finds her attractive. He undoubtedly admires her as he would admire another man for her really great ability at being able to do X, Y, and Z. There are many women in all walks of life who possess a great personal magnetism, whom all, including the men, admire as great and powerful characters, but who can never change a man's admiration into love or into attract, you know, being attracted. So one such woman, a famous Sunday school teacher, illustrated the situation. So here's an example of a woman who was loved by all sexes, you know, the, the male and the females, but she for, was, was not able to really attract a man. So her magnetic personality and noble character drew hundreds of young people to join her class. Thousands of men and women of all ages attend whenever she gave a public lecture. In spite of this almost universal respect and admiration, the average man would never think of seeking her private company. Hmm. It would never cross his mind to indulge in an intimate conversation with her or to make her his little girl to cherish and protect throughout a lifetime. So everyone knows of such women, healthy, charming, enjoyable, who men admire greatly, but they don't seem to be fascinated by or really attracted to. And the reason for this is that they lack an air of frail dependency upon the men. They're too capable, too independent to stir a man's feelings or sentiments toward her. The air of being able to 
kill her own snake or do everything herself without needing the man to do it is what destroys the charm of so many business and professional women. So this again is not to say that you can't have a career, but it's about how you go about it. So it is the absence of this air that permits many a brainless doll to capture and enable an intelligent man whom one would expect to choose a more sensible companion. So this really, you know, really kind of showing that you have a lot of women who women tend to look at and say, well, she's a bobblehead. She's dumb. She doesn't even like, she doesn't even have a brain. You know what I mean? Um, that's some, you know, and, and that woman tends to attract all the men, but it's because she's more of a feminine woman versus a woman who, you know, maybe super, super smart and intelligent and has all these abilities to do all these things and is really trying to constantly compete with men and really show up men and show that she's smarter and she's better and she's more capable. You know, a man would not be as attracted to her as he would be to a woman who maybe isn't as smart, but is very feminine. And again, this doesn't mean that you can't be smart. I feel as though I'm a very intelligent woman. Uh, my husband seems to think so as well, but you know, it's a way of going about it. And again, that's something that we're going to go a little deeper into in this video. So the kind of woman a man wants is first an angelic being whom he can adore is better than himself. And second, a helpless creature whom he would like to gather up in his arms and cherish and protect forever. The, ad the admirable woman just mentioned fills the first requirement, but not the second. So though it's absolutely necessary to fill the first of being these, this angelic being, you can't afford to do, do as these women do and neglect the second. So you need to be both. You don't need to just be one or the other. You really need to be able to practice both. So occasionally we see a rather small, this is another example we're going to go into. So you'll see a rather small short man married to either a very tall woman or a bigger woman who big, who's bigger than him. So it's interesting to observe that she doesn't seem large in his eyes because she's given him the impression of smallness. So again, it's about how you go about your life, how you live your life. What's your character? What's your personality? How do you move? Are you graceful? Are you feminine? Are you innerly feminine and outwardly feminine? So such a man is even apt to call her his little girl. She has managed, in spite of her size, to give him the impression of delicacy. By letting him know that she can't get along without him, she has been able to disguise her rather large and overpowering figure. So now that we've really kind of described this feminine nature, we're kind of going to go deeper into it. We're going to talk about the characteristics of this feminine nature and we're going to really describe it. So the first character would be weakness. And again, this is not literally you being a weak person and not being able to take care of yourself. The feminine nature is weak, soft and delicate compared to the man's strong and firm nature. So again, it's really just making that distinguishing quality between a masculine and feminine person, right? So this does not imply weakness in a negative way, such as weakness of character or lack of moral, moral courage, or literally just being a weak person who can't lift anything. Um, so a really good example would be 1 Peter 3, 7, where it says, in the same way husbands, live understandingly together, giving respect to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the favor of life so that your prayers are not hindered. So one thing I learned is that when Peter is saying to, you know, to really respect your wife as you would a weaker vessel, he's really like straight up telling these men in the Hebraic mindset and perspective, just like you would care for your balls or your testicles because that is your weaker vessel, but it's a super important part of you because it carries your seed and because you couldn't um, extend your life without them. And, you know, there's a very important, a man's very protective of his, his groin, his testicles, right? So just like you would care and respect your testicles, you need to respect a woman. You need to respect your wife because one, she does carry your seed. You know, you cannot... Um, prolong your life by having children without her and you need to respect her because she is tender she is delicate she is soft she needs to be protected and cared for so um, just an FYI there when it comes to that verse that you know these these um, disciples and these Hebrew men and women were very straightforward and very honest and very kind of blunt they weren't you know walking around the subject you know trying to avoid it they was letting you know straight on this is how you need to treat your woman need to care for her. So another characteristic would be submissiveness. Um, and we're going to talk about submission a lot more, trust me, in a few minutes. So the feminine nature is submissive, trustful, and adaptable, all yielding qualities which make her a good follower. This makes it more natural for her to surrender to her husband's leadership. 
Dependence. So feminine dependency can be defined as a woman's need for masculine care and protection. She needs a strong arm to lean on, a breadwinner to depend on, and a protector to feel safe with. Why? Because she's weaker and more delicate, and because her whole purpose in life is home-oriented. All of her energies are directed toward the home, making a nest for her little ones and a castle for her king. If she is to succeed in her domestic career, she must devote her time and energy in that direction. Therefore, she must have a man to provide the living, do the strenuous work, and protect her and her children from harm. So, I know the first thing I'm going to hear is women who say, well, what if I don't want a family? What if I don't want to work? Of course, you have your special case. I mean, what if I do want to work? You have your cases where women do go into the workforce. I'm not going against that. You also have women who end up not marrying or not having a family. I'm not going against that either. But for the most part, we know, especially when I, uh, when I talk about Womanhood 101 and reference it, that the role of a woman is definitely to really take care of the household, to help rear or grow or teach the children, to give counsel to her husband, and to really just care for the household. This doesn't mean that you're in the kitchen all the time or anything like that. It actually means you get a lot of really awesome management skills because if you can manage a house, you can manage anything. People tend to like really kind of downplay being a housewife or being a stay-at-home wife or a stay-at-home mom, but it's a lot more work than you think it is. Um, so anyways, moving on. So you have tenderness. So feminine women are inclined to have tender feelings for the helpless, the innocent, and the suffering. They're easily awakened to pity or sympathy. So an, uh, the example of Amelia in the Vanity Fair is a typical example of tender emotions um, where she cried over, it says she cried over a dead canary or a mouse that the cat had seized upon or the end of a novel were it ever so stupid. So literally, you know, having that um, tender feeling and, and, and being able to feel emotion and sense emotion. The trouble that we as women have is that we tend to feel ashamed of our feelings and try to withhold them. How many times have you read a book or watched a movie that had a really sad ending or a really sad part and you try to hold back your tears? That's something that we should never do. We should never strike, strike, stri oh my gosh, never stifle a tender emotion just because we're in the presence of a man. This betrayal of tenderness of heart is fascinating of men, to men. So men actually find it really cute, really tender, really delicate when they see that their woman is crying over a scene in a movie. You know, it's showing that, you know, even in a harsh world, you know, even when something happens, like even like, um, when something happens on the news or you hear about something, you know, going on and you cry for those people who are hurting or, and who are, you know, weak and who have no help or, you know, whatever the case is, when you cry or when you show emotion or sympathy or empathy for that person, your husband is seeing or your man is seeing that you are able to still be delicate and soft and tender even in a super harsh world. And that's something that the men like to see. They like to see that they're, they're able to be the strong men while you, in, in protecting you. You know, that's really the view that they like to have. Um, so another one would be fearfulness. So feminine women have a natural fear of dangers, whereas men are inclined to be unafraid of dangers, especially if they're in control of the danger. Men will, in fact, sometimes take women into danger just to see how fearful women are and how unafraid they are and how unafraid they as a man are. So, for example, a man loved to take his sailboat into dangerous waters and keel it over on its side. His wife was terrified, but in spite of this fact, he would do it over and over and over again. And she would ask, you know, why does he do this when he knows I'm so afraid? And the answer would be because you're afraid and he's not. Um, and he's really kind of showing his manliness. So, first example that comes to mind for me would be when my husband decides that he wants to drive super fast in his car, which isn't even really super fast, but he will purposely put his foot down on the pedal and have the engine rev and we just speed up really fast and I get terrified. I'm already somebody who's terrified of driving and terrified of traffic and yeah you know something like a fear that is you know definitely within my own mind and, and not necessarily a normal fear the fear that i have of being in a car and driving and things like that and so he'll do those things because he's not afraid he knows he's in complete control and i'll be sitting there like babe stop 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 you're going too fast and even my dad has done it before many times where he'll speed up super fast and he'll do it just to get a rise out of me because he knows it scares me so you know when i had came across that example i was like you know what that makes so much sense because I would ask myself, I'd be like, why does he do that? You know, why does my husband feel the need to do that? Well, there you go. <laughs> it explains it perfectly. 
Um, so women also are afraid of unreal dangers such as lightning, thunder, strange noises, spiders, cockroaches, thank you, and huge spiders. Brings me back to, I don't even know, it was like a couple weeks ago, there was literally the size of my palm. So it was the size of my palm, it was a huge spider, I was going to the fridge and I see a spider and I immediately close the fridge and run. And my husband's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, there's a spider, I, I can't. And he's like, go kill it. And I'm like, no, 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 you have to do it. So he gets up and he does it and he realizes how big the spider is. But he was like laughing at me because the whole time, like after the spider was dead and everything, I was still like tiptoeing into the kitchen for the next like three or four days. Like no lie, I was like tiptoeing into the kitchen, checking every nook and cranny before I would grab anything because I was still terrified that there might be another huge spider in there. So just tons of examples of, you know, of things that it's okay, it might not be a rational fear to be afraid of a spider or a cockroach or, you know, a mouse or anything like that. But it's a fear that as a woman, we naturally may tend to have. And it's a, it's a time where a man can really rise up and squash the bug or, you know, get rid of the mouse or whatever the case is and be like, that wasn't so bad, babe, you know, it really isn't that, but he can show his manliness, you know what I'm saying? So men love this trait in women, for in the presence of such weakness, the man feels stronger. If she shrinks from a spider or hops on a chair at the sight of a mouse, how manly he feels that he can laugh at such tremblings and calm her fears. It does a man more good to save a woman from a mouse than a tiger, since he feels more power over a mouse. Another, uh, continuing on with fearfulness, feminine women tend to be fearful in the presence of heavy traffic. Hello. <laughs> when such a woman approaches an intersection, so even when you're crossing an intersection as a woman, um, typically feminine women would not just charge forth into the crosswalk or across the street. Typically they would hesitate first and really kind of grab onto their man and allow the man to lead them across the street. Um, so rather than be offended, the man actually would appreciate her fearfulness and his ability to protect her and to guide and lead her. So. Now we're gonna talk about how to actually awaken your dependent feminine nature. So we, but just now we covered all the different main characteristics of the feminine nature, of being a feminine woman. Um, and now we're gonna really talk about how you can begin to awaken it. Because a lot of us, that's kind of dormant within us. We tend to stifle a lot of things within ourselves and not embrace our, our feminine energy and our femininity in general that we were created with. So first, acquire a feminine attitude. So dispense with any air of masculine strength, ability, competence, or fearlessness and acquire an attitude of frail dependency. This doesn't literally mean that you can't function. It just means you're acquiring an attitude of, of allowing your man to be able to do those things that a man can do himself without you needing to do it before him or take care of it because he's taking too long, you know, X, Y, Z. So let your man know that you need his help and that you appreciate it and that you cannot get along in this world without him because technically it is true. Um, be adaptable to his life and circumstances. Get rid of the attitude of being a boss or a, you know pushing him or controlling him or nagging him. Um, letting go of needing to control, command, and instead acquire a spirit of sweet submission. Um, second, eliminate the masculine work. So you can never truly be a feminine woman unless you eliminate the masculine work. To do this, you have to first decide what work you want to eliminate. So is it maybe that you want to quit your job or do you want to stop paying the bills or maybe you want to stop budgeting for you know the money in the house or maybe you don't want to do the yard work anymore or you don't want to take care of the yard as far as mowing the lawn and doing the edging or you don't want to have to fix things in the house where they're bro when they're broken and stuff like that. you know. Um, all of those things. So once you decide what work you actually want to eliminate, explain your intentions to your husband and don't just say, I feel. One thing I've learned is that men tend to communicate and think differently. So they tend to think rationally. So you really have to explain what you think first and then explain how you feel about it. Whereas men, you know, because we tend to focus more on feelings, when men communicate with us, they should actually communicate more of their feelings first and then explain the rationality. So when you communicate to your husband about things that you may want to change, things you may want to stop doing around the house, um, you would let him know, you know, well, rationally, you want to be able to, example would be, okay, I don't want to have to fix the things around the house anymore. 
And that's because as a woman, I want to be able to give more of my time to making sure that the house is comfortable for you and making sure that it's clean and making sure that I have time to prepare meals so that we can have more home cooked meals X, Y, Z. But I can't if I'm putting all my energy towards fixing the issues in the house. And I feel as though I'm not able to be as feminine of a woman when I'm doing more manly tasks like fixing, I don't know, whatever, a hole in the wall or whatever. That would be a way that you can go to your, your husband or your man about getting rid of the masculine work. So you approach it rationally first and then approach with your feelings so that he can really understand. Um, so you wouldn't wanna ask him to take over these masculine jobs and discuss each one with him so that he clearly understands. And then you wanna tell him that you need to do these things so that you can devote yourself, like I just said, to your feminine role in the home. Also tell him that you feel unfeminine doing them and would like to be relieved so that you can truly become a feminine woman. If he accepts, completely let go of the task. Don't sit there and say, well, he has been three weeks now and he still hasn't fixed X, Y, Z, or it's been, you know, this amount of time and he still can't budget right. You know, you have to let it go completely. You can't feel the need to look over his shoulder and nag him. He knows what the issue is. He knows what needs to be addressed. He knows that he just agreed to do X, Y, and Z. So let him do it in his time. Um, so don't worry about the outcome. If he fails, he will learn from the failure. And sometimes it may take him time, especially when it comes to things like a lot of women tend to really kind of control the money in the house. And a lot of times the person who controls the money is the person who's the provider. So in order for you to kind of let go of the control of the money, you have to allow him to fail and make mistakes. Don't know who that is. Um, sometimes that may mean that he may overdraft the account the first couple times that he's doing the budget. Or maybe he'll buy something that maybe you would have been like, well, why on earth did he buy that? Um, but allowing him to make a mistake and learn from it so that he can get better in that role. Because then if you try to put your fingers back in the jar, he's going to completely just give it back to you and say, well, you know what you're doing. Let me just let you do it. So you have to completely let go of the task. Um, don't worry about the outcome. And if he fails to follow through on the job, don't complain or pressure him to get things done. The concern is his now. He may never take hold until you actually let go. If his negligence provokes you, try to understand his world through his eyes because sometimes things that are important to us are not as important to him. And he may be more focused on things going on at his job than he is about some little things that need to be fixed around the house. So he may get to it when he's able to, when he's focused on it. If he refuses though to accept the masculine work and you, you let him know how you feel rationally and then you know emotionally how you do feel about the situation and he refuses to really accept that work and to allow you to let go, don't make an issue of it. Do what must be done yourself and let the rest go. Continue to live these womanhood points that we're learning. Continue to be feminine and to do things in a feminine way. And his attitude will eventually change. And a little later, you can then approach him again. So sometimes it may take patience. Sometimes he may not want to take on the task right away. So you can continue to do it, but you can do it in a feminine way. Um, so, and this is the note I was getting ready to make actually, which is funny. So if you're stuck with a masculine job, as you try to unload the masculine work bit by bit, there will be times that you may be stuck. So if so, you can do it in a feminine manner. So you need not perform masculine tasks with manly efficiency. If you must fix the furnace or repair a leaking roof or handle finances, do so in a feminine manner. Your husband will then soon realize that you need masculine assistance. This goes the same way if you work at a more masculine job. Um, things like being a construction worker or if you're a soldier in the army or in the military in general, um, there is a way that you can still be in the military but do a more feminine role or do things more femininely. So, you know, there's definitely a way around everything. I understand that not everybody is able to be a stay-at-home wife. Some women have to work. But it's about being a feminine woman at the workplace versus taking on the characteristics of a man. Um, so, like I said, your husband will realize that you need assistance and if you can work as well as he can, he'll never come to your rescue, which is really true. If you don't ever let go or if you don't ever embrace your femininity, he will always see you in those eyes. If he, she can take care of it herself, she doesn't need my help. So he won't help you. He won't even see that you need the help, even though in your mind you're like, why isn't he helping me? He's going to be looking like, well, she's got it. She doesn't need my help. Um, so you may be stuck with that job or that work or whatever it is permanently. 
Um, so next we're going to talk about submission. So you want to be submissive. The word submissive means to yield to a higher authority or to leave matters to the discretion or judgment of others. We're going to talk about the Hebraic perspective as well, so don't worry. Um, so the opposite of being submissive is to be stubborn, unyielding, rebellious, or disobedient. To develop your feminine nature, yield to your husband's rule with a spirit of sweet submission. This is one of the most charming qualities of womanhood, measuring greatly in the success of marriage. It's also one of the most rebelled against. We're going to talk about that. So... When in discussions with your husband or any man, avoid unyielding opinions that lead to heated arguments as this is unfeminine and offensive to men. And I'm going to point out that this doesn't literally mean that you're not allowed to have an opinion or you're not allowed to have a point. It's about how you go about it. So let's go, go ahead and dive in a little deeper. So a man wants a woman to express her viewpoint and defend it. But it's, he gets offended when she takes such a firm stand on an issue that he cannot convince her, even with the soundest logic. It's better to surrender your point of view to a man than to win an argument. So it's really about picking and choosing your battles. And this does not apply to your moral convictions or to following Torah or to following Yahuwah. This is little things around the house. Like maybe you truly believe that the money should be spent um more more money towards groceries every month and he completely disagrees rather than getting into a heated argument about how you're right and he's wrong because you run the house and he doesn't you know you have to pick and choose your battles is it really worth it or is it something that you can kind of let him win let him have his say let him decide that you know we're going to put more money maybe towards our debt instead of groceries and allow him to make that decision it's not about oh well you know first example i could think of well we're going to eat ham on easter and we're going to celebrate easter when you know that celebrating easter is against torah and so is eating ham that's something that you would have a firm stance and you would not budge on that's completely different so this is not about you know submitting your your moral your moral beliefs or you know you're following torah and you're following yahuwah and you're completely have to let go of that that's not about that. It's about little things, you know, in the house, your budget, your, you know, is the wife going to work or is she not going to work? Um, you know, little things like that, you know, different, totally different subjects. Um, so it's more feminine to pick and choose your battles and to choose to let him um, to surrender your point of view rather than to win an argument. And that's one thing that happens in any relationship. It's more important to uh, save the relationship than it is to win an argument. Um, and that's one thing that I'm sure many of you guys can really, you know, um, I don't even know what the word is. Like, you know what that feels like to have lost a friend because you guys had a deep heated argument of some sort and you just had to win that argument or maybe they just had to win that argument and you guys ended up walking away not being the same anymore and your relationship really suffered because of it. So you really have to learn how to pick and choose your battles. Um, so a major problem that most women, including myself, have with the feminine nature is submission. So it's the prefix of sub that I think really kind of bothers us. We don't want to be under anybody. The idea of subordinating our desires and those of our husbands may offend our ego and our pride, which is something that we know the Torah and Yah really kind of speaks against. He wants a humble, a humble heart and not a prideful heart. Um, and it may offend our intellect and sense of trust. At its basis, submission is an organizational issue. Every organization has someone who's in charge, and the member of the organizations of the organization follows that person's leadership. The home is literally the same thing. So let's talk about the Hebraic the Hebraic form of submission. So Ephesians 5:22 says, "Wives submit to your own husbands as to the king or master." Um, so the word "submit" is one of the most over overused and wrongly defined words submission doesn't literally mean to obey in the sense of do whatever i tell you don't question me keep your mouth shut just do what i say that's not what submission is so when you look at the word submit in ephesians 5 22 the greek word is hupotasso and the strongest concordance number would be g5293 and it means to get under and lift up or to put in order so definitely you're not seeing the word to obey to listen to hear any of that in there you're seeing to get under and lift up or put in order now when you look at the hebrew word um, that has the same definition of this this greek word it would be the word kibosh which is h3533 and it means to put under to conquer 
bring into subjection, bring under control, to place the foot on the land in the sense of subduing it, or also to place one's foot into another nation in the sense of subduing it. So in context, this word really has to do with war. So to subdue something would then be to subdue something on the outside of yourself. Um, so this, obviously, this definition would not be very consistent with what submit actually means because you see in verse 21 that it says to submit to one another out of reverence for Yahusha the Messiah. So both are told to submit to one another. And if it was supposed to be like war, we would both constantly be trying to subdue each other, which is really kind of like today's relationships if you think about it. The woman's trying to control and subdue the man, and then the man is trying to control and subdue the woman, and it ends up becoming this whole war between the families, and then families fall apart. So submission does not mean to obey. The Greek word for that is hupako, which means to listen or to hearken to. Submission, which is hupatasso, means to get under and lift up or put in order. It does not mean obedience. It's a voluntary raising of everyone else to your own personal level of importance and worthiness. So really kind of meshing perfectly with that word love, which we learned in the first video of this series, love was really a being able to see someone literally as yourself and giving your all to them and living out Torah so that you can then reflect Yah in them and they can be elevated or risen up. So same thing, same idea here with submission. So other languages further reinforce this concept. So for example, uh, the German translation of the word submit or submission means to place oneself at the disposition of another. It can also be a military term like we just discussed, referring to the equal sharing of tasks to support or to fill one's part of the assignment. So where does this submit definition really stem from? So you have to realize that um, in our New Testament and things like that, that is written in the Greek, and it's really like the Greek mindset, which stems from the Babylonian mindset. And so you have to realize that the Hebrew people were really brought into captivity multiple times. And some of the most influential ones were the Babylonians and the Greek slash Romans. So with the Babylonians, it was really influential in changing how the Hebrews actually functioned and lived their life. Babylonians were really big on prostitutes, so the whole submission idea for them was sexual. And then the Greeks had five classes of women. They had a wife who stayed at home and didn't go anywhere. They had the prostitutes who, though they never left the house, everybody knew where they were and how to get to them. You had slaves, you had the bottom of the rung, bottom of the food chain women. And then you had the free women who had gained such wealth and status that they were able to own their own businesses and homes and properties and things like that. And so you have to realize that you're getting your definition of submission from people who completely went against the whole Hebraic perspective of a woman and of what submission is. You had Babylonians and Greeks or Romans who really did not really reverence or respect women. So the Hebrew world is a whole different view. So again, looking at Ephesians 5.21, we're told to submit to one another out of reverence for Yahusha. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for Yahuwah opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So it's really about being, it's, it's about subservience versus respect. And you really want to focus on the respect because the subservience is really like the subduing, the forced submission. So there's a difference. Yah is calling for the orderly arrangement of something, which we know is that Hebrew word debar, um, which we learn about when we look at John chapter 1 and the word of Logos and Debar. We'll get into that in another video when it comes to the faith foundations. Um, but submission literally is to orderly arrange yourself under the person of authority. It's only beautiful when that person is willingly doing it. So if you have to be subdued or if you're being disrespected or you're being forced into submission, it's a, it's 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 almost like a warlike situation where you become miserable and the other person becomes miserable. It's not a beautiful thing. And that's not the type of submission that Yah is asking us for. So when it comes to that verse, Ephesians 5.22, these are really words that should be used. The first one is going to be the Hebrew word shalak. And that means to send or to move something towards a goal. So example would be, I'm going to properly arrange myself in the proper order. Um, and in my position, I'm going to move or send that person above me, so the person who's above me in position, towards their goal. So as a wife, it would be, okay, I am trying to help my husband get to his goal. 
So I'm not going to hinder him in any way. And really his goal would be to fulfill his role as a man. So to be the protector, the provider, the guide, and whatever else Yah calls him to. So as a wife, it is my goal to make sure that I am sending him towards his goal and helping him in any way that I can. So if that means that I'm taking care of the home so that he can then focus on his primary goal, his primary role of fulfilling the role of being a man, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and it goes vice versa because you have that verse 21 where it really says we're supposed to submit to each other. So that really means we're supposed to help each other. So while I'm helping him, he's also going to be helping me to reach whatever goal it is that I have as a woman in fulfilling my role of, you know, being a godly woman following after the Torah and after the Messiah and after Yah. So, really awesome example of true submission was Sarah and Abraham. So, when Abraham was given that promise of being the father of many nations, and she was not having any success as far as they weren't having a child, they hadn't had one, they were trying and it wasn't working, she gave Hagar, her, her maiden or her slave, to him so that he, his promise, the promise that Yah gave him could be fulfilled. So she was helping him to get to his goal. Now granted she wasn't correct in doing so and you know Yah really had to kind of correct her and let her know that this was the promise that's going to come from both of you and not from someone else. Uh, you know it was the intent of her heart where you could see she was truly submitting to her husband. Um, and so it also kind of worked the other way because you also see that Abraham was willing to wait for both him and Sarah to be able to have the child. So he was seeing that, you know, hey, we've both been promised, you've been promised to be the mother and I've been promised to be the father of many nations. And so I'm going to wait and have respect and reverence for you so that we can wait for this promise to come to pass. So they were both, you know, really respecting and submitting to each other but they both kind of did it in their own ways and one was doing it more correctly while the other one was kind of mistaken but the point was that their intent was there so the other word that we had mentioned that could be used would be debar which is the word for literally meaning the word or an orderly arrangement of things so again this doesn't mean that you take your own definition of submission and put it on to the person that you want to submit to you it's about going by Yah's Torah going by his word of what submission is and living out that Torah and living out his word that will actually cause the person to revere and respect you and submit to you so it has to do with reverence the person's role is one that you cannot fill so you reverence that person or you respect that person by allowing them to fulfill their role with no hindrances so no you know no blockages no obstacles so it's about balance there's a mutual balance in submission it can be positive and negative it can be powerful but it can also cause war when being subdued so perfect example of a positive um, example of submission would be Queen Esther so she was submissive to her powerful king you know she when she went into uh, went to speak to him without permission she made sure that she followed the per correct protocol in order to win his you know his approval his authority in order for him to save her life and allow her to then um, really kind of invite him to the dinner she was having and be able to really fulfill that plan of saving her people. So through her submission, she was able to save the nation of Israel. Jezebel, on the other hand, she was also submitted to Ahab, her husband, but she was a very wicked woman. And so she was willing to kill and destroy in order to get her husband to that goal, right? And so she actually turned her power into control and she became very wicked. So you see the two, the two complete opposite sides of submission and what submission can do. So submission, again, is not about control. It's about sending a person towards their goal. Um, and again, we're told in Ephesians 5.21 that we're supposed to submit to each other. So while the wife does submit to the husband, he's also to submit to her or reverence or respect her and help her to get to her goal. So, 1 Corinthians 7, 4, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So that's really kind of showing the cyclical idea, because again, everything in Hebrew is cyclical, not linear. It's the cyclical idea of balance and of, I am showing reverence to you, I am treating you like I would like to be treated, and you are doing the same for me. 
So let's talk a little bit more about submission from the wife's point of view, the wife's role. So the wife's submission to her husband is not about being mistreated. No wife is required to submit herself to abuse of any kind. Both members of a married couple have a right to be themselves and both members of that same married couple have a right to be heard and to have their perceptions and desires considered. Since the husband has the overall responsibility to Yah, because you see that he's compared to being the Messiah, um, as far as how he's supposed to treat the wife so just like the messiah treats his bride the husband is supposed to treat his wife and you see that there is a divine order of the of of yah being you know at the top and then you're having the man and then the woman and then the children and then everything else at the bottom um so since the husband has overall responsibility to yahuwah and to society for the outcomes of the household he has the authority to lead that household the wife is to follow her husband's righteous leadership and may resist any directions he gives contrary to the teachings of her religion. So if Torah, if Yahuwah says not to do something and your husband's telling you to do it, you have a full right to say no and to stand your ground and to not do it. Because in that case, it would not be righteous leadership going on. Um, righteous leadership would be, he's not asking you to do something that's illegal or immoral or going against Yah's Torah. So if you feel any resistance about something that your husband tells you to do, and it's you need to consider two things. So first, you need to figure out, is he asking you to do something illegal or immoral? Um, or is he just asking you to do something that you disagree with? There's a difference. So if your husband's wanting you to do something that's immoral or illegal, you have every right to refuse. And if it's going against Torah or against your moral beliefs, it's you have every right to refuse and to say no. But if it's something that you just disagree with, again, going back to that idea of I think more money should go to groceries and he thinks more money should go to debt. Um, if it's something that you just disagree with, you have to realize that he was put in authority over the household. And then in that case, you would show him the respect and not put a hindrance in his goal of being the leader of the household. And you would allow him to make that final decision. You would not sit there and be a hindrance to him and argue with him and cause him to be miserable trying to make a decision. You would allow him to have the ease of making the decisions for the household. So if you disagree, you can express your feelings about the matter and leave the issue in his hands for the final decision. A wife also has the option of praying for a change of heart, both for your own heart or for your husband's heart, either way, and that somehow things will work for the good when you obey his righteous leadership. Um, and sometimes I want to say again, this could be mistaken leadership. It could be, you know, he's righteous in his ways and he really truly thought that something would be correct. Like maybe he really truly thought putting more money towards debt would be a great idea. And so you, you prayed about it and he didn't change his heart on it. And so you just said, okay, well you do whatever you feel is right. And then he figures out two months down the road that maybe you guys did need more money for food because you didn't have enough food for the family on the table. And so then he will say, okay, well let's put more money towards groceries instead. You know, that's just an example of understanding that sometimes he's gonna make mistakes, but you allow him the room and the freedom to do so because that is his role and not your role. Okay, so if a woman is, a ble is blessed to be a wife, because it is a blessing, let me tell you, um, she's called to support her husband's righteous mission in life, whatever that might be, as his joyful help for, helper to achieve his goals and outcomes. That is true submission. So now we've covered submission. That's a really big one. We're going to go ahead and finish out with the rest of the ways that you can awaken your feminine nature. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and end it because I know this video is getting long. Um, but these are things that we really need to cover as ladies because I feel like as women, especially with the feminist movement and with the Western culture of things, we've really kind of lost our way. And, you know, when it came to submission, it was never anything I really understood. But having the understanding Hebraically that I have now, I see it completely differently. And I happily submit to my husband every day. So another way is not to subdue your fearfulness. So don't subdue or try to stifle your natural tendency to be afraid of dangers. In the face of danger, you're going to need your man's masculine protection or at least appear to need it. So even if maybe you're not always afraid of something, allow him to be that protector anyways. Um, don't subdue your tender emotions. So as we explained earlier, don't, you know, try to stifle your, your emotions um, for the innocent and for the long suffering and for anything. Don't try to stifle your tender feelings towards something. Don't try to hold back your tears. Let yourself 
go. Such tender sympathy is really attractive in a woman. Uh, don't try to excel him. So to preserve your femininity, don't compete with men in anything which requires masculine ability. So example would be don't try to compete with him for um, a better job or higher pay or greater honors, things that are more manly. Um, even things like in the gym, you know, trying to lift more weights than him or just trying to be better than him in things that are considered to be more manly things. Um, invite his care and protection. Let him open the door for you or pull up your chair or help you with your coat. If he doesn't offer, sometimes you need to just slow down and let him do it first. There's been times where um, I was watching some couple and they, it, was a, it was a hilarious situation where the wife was walking so fast and she was so used to the husband opening the door for her that she actually walked into the door because he wasn't able to catch up with her and actually open the door for her. So sometimes it's a matter of slowing down or giving him a clue or giving him a hint and allowing him to take that hint and act on it versus you just saying, he's not moving fast enough, whatever, I'm going to do it myself. Um, and so I notice I do that. There's a lot of times where I'll just kind of pause and stop at the door and allow my husband to open the door for me versus me always opening the door myself. Um, so if he doesn't offer, perhaps you did it yourself too quickly. Next time you need him to open the door for you or whatever, give him time to do it or give him a sign. Stand there in front of the door. If you want him to put your coat on you, you know, give him your coat and turn around so that he can put your coat on you. You know, there's different ways that you can go about it. He doesn't know automatically what you want him to do, especially if you're a woman who tends to be more independent and tends to do things yourself all the time. Even things like saying, oh, babe, can you can you bring the groceries in the house and walking in the house? He's not going to have a choice really but to go and get the groceries. He's going to see you're giving him the hint that you want him to get the groceries. And he'll go grab the groceries for you out of the car, bring them in the house so that you can then put them away. It's just different ways of doing things that us as women, we tend to be like, like so much in a rush and we want it done now that we end up doing it ourselves and then so the man's like well you're fully capable I don't need to do it for you so confine your request to things that women need men for not things women can just do themselves so don't be ridiculous and be like well I need you to do every single thing for me you know if you really truly can do it yourself it's more of those masculine things or the chivalrous things that a woman would like for a man to do and allowing him to do it and giving him the hints and the signs to do it so, live your feminine roles. The best way to develop femininity is in the home as, your function, as you function as the wife, mother, and homemaker. And we're actually going to be talking more about the feminine role, so don't worry about that. Um, and then this is the most ideal um, for acquiring all the gentle traits of femininity. So although men are fascinated by the frailty of women, there is a balancing quality that they appreciate, and this is called the sweet promise. So a man needs assurance that with all of your helpless dependency on him to take care of you, protect and wait on you, that somewhere hidden within is your ability to meet an emergency. So he knows that even though he does care for you now, he's your protector and provider, that if there was an emergency, you would be able to step up. He needs to know that in order for him to truly feel comfortable, you know, really providing and taking care of you the way that a man should. So he needs to know that in times of urgent need, you would have the womanly courage, strength, endurance, and ability to solve difficult problems, and that you would not be helpless. This is known, like I said, as the sweet promise. It, could, it should be somewhere within your character, and he must perceive that it is there. Many women show forth this promise when put to the test. For example, a young widow left with several small children to support. She sets out single-handedly to battle against all odds. She slaves and struggles, dares and suffers in her effort to provide for her children. When defeat stares her in the face, she doesn't whimper. Taking her lot as a matter of course, she grits her teeth and braves the struggle again. And same thing with single moms. You know, any you know, this is a perfect example of a, a single mom who the husband has kind of left and she's forced in this situation to really kind of take on both roles in a sense and really kind of provide for her children and for herself and also protect them and all of that. So no matter what pain she suffers from her overwork, she has a smile of comfort for her little one. No matter how weary she gets, she forgets her own weariness at the slightest hint of danger to her children. She'll, you know, you look to the, the widows, look to the single women, to the single moms of this earth, and you'll find that many compare to angels of heaven. 
This sweet promise arises from a noble character, which includes love, faith, endurance, and, deter and determination. Some might say that the best way to develop this sweet promise is a career outside the home, but I kind of disagree with that. A career outside the home takes the woman away from her husband and many times requires her to become another man's help me. This is something that when I read it, I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense because you never really think about it that way, but it's true. Um, so how then can a wife who is away from her husband up to 60 hours a week best know how to fulfill her husband's desires? She wouldn't. Rather, a woman who concentrates her efforts on guiding the home and achieving emotional and intellectual intimacy with her husband and embracing and accomplishing her feminine roles is better equipped to serve her family in an emergency. Paradoxically, in addition to enjoying greater emotional and intellectual intimacy with her husband, a diligent homemaker acquires a wide variety of adaptable management traits and skills, not simply learning a narrow job or occupation as in the workplace. So no, you don't have to go and get a job in order to know how to take care of yourself and be independent if the case arose. Just managing your home alone gives you a lot of those traits. Now, of course, yes, having a resume and being able to get a job based on your resume is definitely helpful. So I'm not saying that you can't go and get a job if you want to in order to prepare yourself for if something was to happen. Definitely can. It depends on the woman. It depends on the family. And of course, it depends on your husband, right? Um, so I'm just saying that it works both ways. You don't have to go get a job in order to be able to be able to sit, take care of yourself and learn how to have that sweet promise. You can stay at home and be able to do the same thing. So as a woman becomes more and more feminine, a man begins to offer his care and protection. As he more fully devotes himself to her care, his love and tenderness for her grows. This is true of any individual who shelters and cares for another. We tend to love whom we serve. Again, that connection between the Hebraic mindset of what love is, meaning to give of oneself. On the other hand, when you neglect somebody you're responsible for, you cease to love them because you're no longer giving to them. Perfect examples of this would be moms who neglect their children and cease to love their children. And you see this mostly with women who run away from their children and leave the children and the husband and go and live a whole different life. Likewise, same thing if a man neglects his wife, he'll cease to love her because you're literally not giving of yourself. You're not loving her. So it's extremely important that you develop your feminine nature so that he'll want to take care of you, do things for you, protect you, serve you, devote himself to you, and in so doing, love you more. So again, we care for our husbands in a very similar way. We prepare him nourishing meals. We wash his clothes. We watch over him to see that he's not neglecting his health. We give him comfort, understanding, and sympathy. We protect him in our own way. We talked about this in Womanhood 101 where women tend to protect men spiritually. We try to prevent others from taking unfair advantage of their generous nature. We try to keep his foolhardy courage from endangering his safety. We try to make certain that his indifference to detail doesn't lead him into trouble. So we're very observant of things and we're able to give him counsel because that's our way of protecting our man. Your devotion increases your love and tenderness for him. Remember, a man does not offer his care and protection unless a woman appears to need it. Therefore, to win his devoted care and magnify his love for you, develop your feminine nature, ladies. This, the rewards of this are completely evident and just completely are astounding and will blow you away. So, closing, a truly feminine woman cannot live an unchaste life. Being sexual with a man outside of the bonds of marriage or engagement, because this is something I've learned recently, um, and I'll talk about that in another video, is repugnant to the feminine spirit. So having sex with a whole bunch of men makes you more manly. So this is just another thing I wanted to briefly cover. Um, it makes you more manly. It makes you harder, hardened with emotions. Um, and in extreme cases, you can develop things like attachment disorder um, from engaging in repeated long-term promiscuity. So constantly having sex with multiple people or, you know, having sex with somebody just because they're your boyfriend, you know, that can really lead to having things like attachment disorder or where you just don't feel anything anymore. You become numb. Um, so allowing the type of intimacy required for sex outside of a lifelong marriage commitment goes against the grain for feminine women. And this perfectly meshes with, um, I'll link it below with the soul ties that I talked about in the should you have sex before marriage video. Um, so I'll link that video down below too. 
So if you have been unchaste in the past or if you've really given yourself over to men in a sexual way outside of marriage or outside that commitment of marriage, I do suggest that you ask Yah to forgive you and that you forgive yourself and that you then apologize to anybody you've offended and that you forgive those who may have hurt you in the process. This is a process that I myself went through um, because I was very promiscuous in college. I'm not even, it's, I was in a very, really, really bad place and I truly felt like I experienced a lot of um, emotionless feeling. I had been hurt so much um, and I had allowed myself to be hurt so much because I put myself in those situations where I almost like was just numb and I didn't care anymore. And um, amazingly enough, that's really when my husband now, he came along into my life. I had, you know, swore off men. I was never going to date again. I was going to be single the rest of my life. And he came along and he really changed my, my perception of men. Um, and so, you know, I just continued to kind of flourish and blossom from there. But it took me a couple years before I finally forgave myself for how I acted during my college years. and. Um, I actually did reach out to the men who I had felt either I had offended or who had really truly hurt me or broke my heart and I let them know that I forgave them and that I hope that they forgave me for how I treated them and I was able to truly let go of everything in my past and I truly believe that that's why I'm in a place now where I'm able to move forward and I'm able to say hey I want to be a more feminine woman and you know I want to be submissive and things like that but had I not let go of the things that happened in college or even when I was in high school, um, had I not let go of the way that I acted or the things that had happened to me, had I not forgiven myself and asked Yah for forgiveness and then, you know, asked those others for forgiveness and let it go, I would still be that same hardened woman that I was two, three, four, five years ago. Um, I would still be, you know, that very selfish woman who was always protecting herself and didn't care about anybody else but herself. And I would, uh, I was a very ugly person at times. I would really like take advantage of others and try to take advantage of their emotions and really just, I, I, I was not in a good place. So to see the difference just from forgiving myself, asking Yah for forgiveness and letting it go completely, I have literally just, I've become a very free woman. I am free to truly embrace my femininity. I don't feel any kind of like rebellion against it or you know negativeness towards it towards it at all i don't feel like being a woman belittles i mean being feminine i don't feel like belittles me in any way as a woman in fact i feel like it frees me as a woman so i see life a lot differently now um i don't act the same way that i used to and a huge part of it is learning to forgive yourself that's probably one of the hardest parts um, is forgiving your actions and things that happened um, and forgiving the people that did hurt you asking them for forgiveness i'm telling you is a huge deal breaker i mean it is even if they never respond back to you or even if they respond negatively you're able to get it off your chest um and then asking yah for forgiveness as well and becoming a new creature by entering into his covenant and walking his torah and really just submitting yourself to him as as your abba your father it is a huge oh it is amazing um and i am living proof of that so um, like I was saying, be determined not to make that mistake again, move forward in life and continue to change and to grow and to flourish as a woman, as a feminine woman. Um, so also in addition to embracing daintiness in all aspects of life, you should seek um, to give up a couple things. So obviously we talked about giving up being bossy and pushy. Um, and so this really has to do with acceptance and accepting others' rights to be themselves. Um, you release yourself from having to be the boss of everybody. You release, release the need to show up your husband in uh, masculine areas or in areas or in anything really. If a woman truly wishes to awaken her feminine nature, she needs to restrain herself away from the competitiveness um, with her husband. Competition with, her, with other women is one thing and in limited amounts can be um, charming. But competition with one's husband simply annoys everybody who's unfortunate enough to have to watch it happen. Um, essentially, the feminine nature corresponds with balanced femininity. Balanced feminine nature um, or maturity is the ability to give of ourselves and yet to retain ourselves as individuals at the same time. Balanced femininity or maturity allows us to be submissive to our husbands generally, but to be assertive when necessary, dependent and tender overall, but efficient and competent in our home lives and when needed in an emergency. 
On the other hand, we're quite capable in the feminine room. And on the other hand, we're in need of assistance with masculine assistance we need assistance with masculine tasks um, you can awaken your feminine nature within you take a small step today another one tomorrow another one the next day and soon you'll be able to fully express that feminine energy inside of you and you'll truly set yourself free so ending today's video i'm so sorry ladies it's been so long of a video but we need to hear this stuff, okay? And I could shorten these, but then I'd have too many videos uploading. So I'm gonna keep it simple for myself and try to just keep it to one topic, right? So, begin to analyze your feminine nature. List the traits that you have and the ones that you lack and the things that you need to work on. Um, ask your husband to do something for you this week, something that takes masculine strength or ability. Let him protect you. Allow yourself to be vulnerable, dependent, and tender. Ask yourself where you're hanging on to masculinity and let it go. If you're stuck with a masculine type of job, do it in a feminine manner or a feminine way. Devise a way to make the transition from masculine energy, being assertive, a capable woman that you must be at work, to transitioning to that soft, tender woman, best suited for success in a relationship with a mature masculine man at home. So if you do have to go out into the workforce, learn how to switch it off. Learn how to try to be, you know, if you have to be a little bit more masculine at work, okay, we get it but be able to turn it off when you come home and really submit to your husband be tender, be delicate, be soft, and really be able to turn into that really feminine woman. Um, ask yourself if you're submissive to your husband, if you're married. If not, you need to ask yourself what's stopping you. Analyze that and, and work to resolve that issue. If you're single or if you're dating or if you're engaged, ask yourself if, you're, if your boyfriend or your fiance's mission in life is one that you can support for the rest of your life. Is he somebody who you see yourself really helping to advance towards his goal? Do you have similar standards morally and life goals? Start to display your sweet promise by excelling in all aspects of your homemaking. Make a homekeeping notebook um, to track your work. Uh, make a routine for your homemaking or read a homemaking book. So one thing that I've actually done is I have a um, I have a chalkboard on my desk um, where I've listed all the daily homemaking tasks that I want to make sure I do so that I can make sure that the home stays beautiful and nice and clean for when my husband gets home so that he doesn't feel the need to do anything. So things like making sure the sink is clean and there's not any dishes in it, making sure that the couch is, you know, nice and you know, cleaned off, no lint or, you know, tons of blankets and stuff on it that it's ready for him when he comes home to sit down or, you know, that the kitchen itself isn't a mess or that my office isn't an eyesore to look at, you know, or that maybe the bathroom is the counters are wiped off. It's not overwhelming when you go in there, clothes are put away in the closet or the bed is made. There is nothing like coming to a, a freshly made bed at night. So um, I've made a list of things so that I can remind myself every day of things that I want to become an expert of doing so that I just do them naturally and so my husband always comes home to a really nice spick and span home so that he can just come home and relax and not feel like oh I have to move dishes around in the sink to put my dish here or the counters are cluttered and I can't even get anything out the fridge and put it on the counter XYZ. So that's it for today ladies. Thank you for sticking with me. The next video we're going to talk about is actually um, going to be the masculine and feminine role. So we're going to talk more about our roles as women and the roles as men. And with that, I want to tell you to continue to seek Yahuwah, continue to seek his role for you as a woman, and continue to seek what femininity is. With that, my sisters, I love you. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.